So I'm going to go ahead and begin. I've given you guys a little background already. Um, so today's profile is, I'm calling the curious case of Henry M. Bay. Um, some of you may uh, find this name kind of familiar, but not quite, um, either from reading pad history or from uh, my presentation yesterday. But uh, what I expect everyone to say is, do you mean Henry M. Day? Um, because that legal controversy we talked about yesterday that gave rise to the Law Student League and uh, eventually to file Fidelsa involved this petition uh, to the Illinois Supreme Court to admit uh, law students who'd begun their legal education before Rule 39 was adopted. Um, and uh, the eventual decision that was made in the Supreme Court was uh, published in his in re application of Henry Day for admission to the bar or just in re day. And that was decided back in June of 1899. So this is a case that, although it ended up being kind of cementing the failure of the Law Student League, um, is actually kind of a, a, a big deal case in Illinois because it was cited hundreds of times thereafter on constitutional issues for the separation of powers uh, in Illinois government. Uh, and obviously it's, it's remembered by File Fidelso, which includes 300,000 members all over the world as, as sort of the seminal case in File Fidelso's history um, featuring the application of Henry M. Day for um, for admission to practice law in Illinois. Uh, the funny thing is Henry M. Day didn't exist. Uh, the real person who's, who's, whose application was being decided along with, you know, who's the named applicant among, you know, 100, more than 100 other applicants from the Law Student League was Henry M. Day. Uh, and this was ultimately just a typo in the reported decision by the Illinois Supreme Court. Um, so here we have this guy who was a student in law school. This was going to be an immediate uh, impact he's having on the legal profession, on constitutional history in Illinois, uh, and they get his name wrong. So it's kind of it's kind of sad, really. But one of the things I wondered after you know I, when I'm looking at Henry Day, and so one of the things I, I wonder about a lot of the law students league people is, well, what happened to them after all this happened? Did they go on like some of them had already done by that time and do another year of law school? Were they ever admitted to practice law in Illinois? Um, and so since this is our, our named applicant in, in Ray Day, I decided to try out, uh, try out to find more information about uh, Henry Bay, which I ultimately was able to do. So Henry Bay, this is his actually class picture from law school at Kent College of Law. Um, he was the son of uh, Danish immigrant George Bay, one of eight children. He was raised in Chicago. So now we start getting to, to where his life and the history of file fidels interact. He decided to pursue a, legal, uh, pursue a legal career. So he enrolls in Kent College of Law in 1896 for what then would have been a two-year course. Um, and for those of you who, uh, who know a little bit about file fidels's history or heard my uh, presentation yesterday, um, at the time, there were all of these law schools in Chicago and throughout the state of Illinois that promised all you have to do is enroll in law school, you pay us, we'll admit just about anybody, um, you do our two-year course, and then you're guaranteed admission to, to the Illinois uh, bar uh, because um, Illinois had diploma privilege, um, but at the same time didn't have any sort of standards for the legal education. Um, so many of these schools were correspondence schools or had weird ideas about curriculum or part-time professors. Um, Chicago Law School, where my chapter started, their big thing they were advertising is um, that we never use more than a single textbook at a time. We have the single textbook method. <laughs> so you never have to buy more than one book at a time was sort of their <laughs> claim to fame. So I, I, don't, I haven't seen any of those books, but I, I think that would have been an interesting way to study law. So this is a... Uh, an article for the graduating class of Kent College of Law in 1898 that appeared in the Chicago Tribune. Um, and I pull it up first because this is where I first found Henry, so it's of interest to me, but also because it has this list of names of other people who were in his class at, uh, at Kent College of Law. Um, 
So the first name on the list is William R. Angel. And for those of you who heard my presentation yesterday, William R. Angel was actually the original um, first named applicant in these cases before the Supreme Court. And the case should have, would have been in re application of Angel et al., except that during the course of the Campbell's Act being passed and um, these petitions being filed, Angel went ahead and enrolled in another year of law school, completed his third year of law school, and took the bar exam. So he was actually admitted under Rule 39 uh, two weeks before the Supreme Court reached their decision in in raid day. So um, I just find that interesting. If you look at the next name, of course, is Henry Bay, who's our topic today. A couple names down, you'll see John Brown. Um, and this is uh, interesting to point out because John Brown becomes uh, one of File Fidelis' founding members, one of Lambda Epsilon's founding members. But if you look in our history, John Brown is said to be a member of the Joseph Story chapter, um, not the Kent chapter or Blackstone chapter that the Kent chapter was merged into. So what is he doing at Kent College of Law? And this is one of the interesting things about when you're researching the history of these early Lambda Epsilon and Phi Alpha Delta members. Um, because their enrollment at the time, Rule 39 was passed, was all in two-year programs, many of them ended up switching schools to do that third year of law school. Uh, and John Brown is one of these. So he got his Bachelor of Laws at Kent College of Law in 1898, and then enrolled at Illinois College of Law for a one-year program and got a second Bachelor of Laws from Illinois College of Law so that he could be admitted under the new rules. And he became one of the founding members of the Story Chapter of Lambda Epsilon um, and uh, went on to continue to be active in file Fidelso for many years. And there are a couple other names on that list that also fall into this category that uh, they started school in one place and ended up at another. Um, you'll see, I think, uh, S. Butler Neltnor, that's Shelley Neltnor, who is one of the Lambda Epsilon members, um, one of the founding Lambda Epsilon members, and one of the signers of the Articles of uh, South Haven. Um, and, but there are just couple names like that that I found interesting. Um, Edward R. Litzinger, who's here listed as an 1898 graduate of Kent College Law, his name appears in uh, the Webster chapter records as a Webster initiate. So he at some point uh, either transferred to uh, uh, Chicago Law School to finish his legal career. Um, and he has an interesting political career in Chicago that we could talk about at another time. So what happens to Henry after the failure of the Law Student League? So the, the sources, and this also gives you a little look at my method. So the, the kind of places where I can find information about these people, um, since no one's left alive to tell me about them from firsthand knowledge, is uh, I look at census records, and I look at newspaper searches, and I look at uh, law school yearbooks and things like that. So we'll start with by looking at uh, where Henry M. Bay appears in the, in the census. First, I will say this. I've searched the Supreme Court records. He was never admitted to practice law. It doesn't look like he ever went back for the third year of law school. Um, he's, never, uh, he's never actually been admitted to the practice of law. And there was actually um, the uh, Illinois Supreme Court Preservation Society. Uh, one of its directors actually looked at Inray Day and did some of this research too. So I, I, I was able to crib some of his research as well. And he confirms that uh, Henry was never admitted to practice law. So if you look at uh, what he reports as his occupation in the census over time, um, the first census after his law school career, he reports that he's uh, a clerk, an insurance clerk. Um, that's in 1900. In 1910 and 1920, he reports himself as a lawyer, which, if he was, which is very suspicious because if he was actually practicing law, he was doing that without a license. Uh, and then eventually he reports himself as a private investigator uh, doing work primarily for a mortgage company. So now I'm curious if he was never admitted to law, um, why is he doing, why is he reporting himself as a lawyer? What was his life like? And why does he keep changing jobs? So I start digging further into his life. And it seems to me now as I start digging that he's the sort of character that nothing ever goes right for. He's living under a cloud. Everything he tries kind of uh, results in scandal and failure. Uh, he's just 
the bad luck, Charlie Brown, cloud over me all the time. And a lot of it seems to be because of the way he's living his life, the choices he makes. He seems to be like, oh, I'll try this, get rich scream, I'll do this, I'll try this. And um, so admittedly what I know about him, I know for newspaper articles, which will probably be the most, uh, um, let's say scandalous things in his life uh, and maybe not representation of his general life. But uh, it's still interesting to see. And it was a lot of fun uh, to dig through. So hopefully uh, you'll have as much he fun hearing stuff about this as I have. So the first time I find him mentioned in the newspapers uh, is this scandal about a false elopement. So you see the headline from May 24th, 1905 in the Chicago Tribune, spurned man vexes girl. So apparently what's happened is um, that letters are sent. This is like the equivalent of a 1905 press release. The letters are literally mailed to various daily newspapers in Chicago um, reporting that uh, Miss Bessie Reynolds uh, uh, has eloped to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which in those days was a lot easier to get to than Vegas, which almost didn't exist at that time. Um, so apparently that was the exotic place to go from Chicago for the weekend. <laughs> Um, so these reports appear that uh, to be signed by her father um, and claim that she has eloped with, uh, almost like a wedding announcement, that she's eloped with Henry M. Bay to be married in Wisconsin. Um, so uh, according to her father, this elopement did not actually happen. Um, there's now this scandal that the family is outraged. Uh, Miss Reynolds is horrified at the idea that she would elope with someone. Um, and they appear to be laying the blame that these letters were forged by some jilted former suitor of hers, um, who she's now rejected, and he's trying to embarrass her. Um, and the family is uh, making all sorts of protestations and say, uh, not only would my daughter never elope, but Henry Bay is just a family friend. They don't have that kind of relationship. Um, Henry Bay himself is quoted as being indignant. Uh, uh, and that the first he heard about it was when the uh, these letters were shown to him, uh, and she, uh, and he also protests. I, I'm I'm not even engaged to the young woman. Uh, I'm just a friend of the family. So we follow the story. Uh, this, by the way, is Miss Bessie Reynolds. She actually got her picture in the paper for this. Um, within a couple of days, the story's changed a little bit. Um, they're still saying she's never eloped. Um, Bessie is saying that would be, I would never elope. This is embarrassing just to have this circulated. Um, but now instead of saying Henry is just a family friend, uh, she's quoted as saying, whether I happen to be engaged to Mr. Bay or not is not a proper matter for discussion. So already things are getting a little hanky. Um, and now they're no longer accusing this prior suitor of writing the letters. Um, her father, John Reynolds, uh, implies to the reporters that uh, the letter writer was a uh, mysterious unnamed woman. Um, family's all embarrassed by this. Uh, and the family is going to hire a lawyer to see if there's anything that can be done. It's a shame Henry wasn't admitted to practice law or maybe he could have helped them himself. Uh, so uh, I look at this and I think, okay, were they a couple? What's really going on? Um, maybe did, maybe they did elope, maybe the, maybe they're, the family's just embarrassed, they're trying to hush it up. So what really happened? So with a, within a year, we find out they did actually get married. Um, their wedding is officially announced in a more traditional way in the newspapers. Um, so I guess he wasn't just a family friend um, because Henry does marry uh, Elizabeth Bessie Reynolds um, in August of 1906. Uh, as an aside, they'll have six children, Marie, Irene, John Henry, Clara, Elizabeth, and Alfreda, and they'll even have a big parcel of grandchildren. So uh, if this was the last I'd heard of Henry, I'd think, okay, things have calmed down, he's gotten married, and we could end the story here with he lives happily ever after. Um, but I'm never content with leaving well enough alone. So uh, I continue to look, and what else can I find out about Henry? Um, what happens after this, I keep digging. So lo and behold, a couple of years later, 
or one year later actually, uh, in October of 1907, there's a new scandal, a kidnapping scandal involving Henry M. Bay in Chicago. So this is uh, one of the first articles that appeared about this scandal. And basically what's reported is that Henry is walking down the street, um, four assailants leap out of a red car, kidnap him at gunpoint. They drive him to an abandoned college in Lake County, Indiana, um, which for those of you not familiar with the Chicago area, Lake County, Indiana is the closest part of Indiana, Chicago. It's basically Chicago suburbs. Um, they steal his money, which he claims to have had $350 on him in cash, which seems to me like an extraordinary amount of money for someone in 1907 to be carrying around in cash. Uh, but they steal his money, they take his clothes, they leave him in this abandoned little college in the middle of the dunes in, in, in Indiana somewhere, um, and they take off. So after they've been gone for a while, Henry reports that he built up his courage, uh, he uh, wanders around naked until he finds a boarding house nearby. Um, he begs for help. Someone at the boarding house uh, loans him a pair of overalls and some old shoes. Uh, and he ends up at the police station making this fantastic report. Um, and this is uh, the first article. Um, and this, the source is, uh, this is actually a, a Indiana newspaper. And you see the police are taking everything very seriously. They're investigating. They went, they found the cottage, they apparently found his clothes abandoned uh, in a field nearby. Um, so they're taking it very seriously and they believe it completely. So they're gonna go to Chicago next day to do some further investigation along with the Chicago police. Uh, the Chicago story isn't quite as uh, positive and supportive of uh, the plight of Henry. Uh, it seems to take more of a, we're not sure about this approach, so once the Chicago police are involved and the, the news articles start having language like, well, at least that's the story we were told. Um, it's almost like the police in Chicago immediately think it's a hoax, um, which given the previous uh, hoax that was involved Henry Bay, makes me wonder if maybe the Chicago police know something about this guy and aren't, aren't ready to take his uh, allegations too seriously. So uh, the story's not over yet. Things actually get a little worse. Um, one thing you'll notice is Henry's a, a, a reported in these stories as a, a clerk working for a realty agent. So um, by the next day, um, you see the headlines. This is a, now a weird tale told by the realty agent. Um, the police are trying to follow up with Henry to get more details and further their investigation. Um, Henry won't even let them in his house. He talks to him through a locked door. At one point he says, well, I may have dreamed the whole thing. Um, Bessie, who they also try to talk to, um, it implies that her father is behind the kidnapping. Um, and uh, she claims that her family has been persecuting the young couple. Um, obviously this is not a marriage that uh, her family was in favor of. Uh, and maybe that has something to do with uh, Henry Bay's uh, spotty uh, personal life story. Um, so they interview Bessie's father, and he says, not only is the story probably made up, but uh, Henry's never had $350 to his name, let alone to carry it around in cash. Um, Henry, by the way, says uh, because of the family persecution, he was getting ready to leave town, and he took his money, the money out of a safety deposit box so he could settle the bill with a local grocer that he owed $200 to. Um, so it all seems very suspicious, and this is, these are things that Henry's making up. Um, and uh, Henry may have now have a, a history of, uh, of this sort of thing and that the local police are aware of it. So Henry did, however, true to his word, leave town. Um, so that's the one part of the story that's true. Uh, the next thing we know, within a month of that occurrence, uh, Henry has left the city of Chicago, and he's moved to Crystal Lake, Illinois. Um, this isn't the, uh, uh, although the locals claim it is, this shouldn't be confused with the Crystal Lake that's uh, featured in the Friday the 13th movie, which I think in the movies is supposed to be in New Jersey, so Jay may, may be more familiar with that Crystal Lake. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, but uh, Henry in is... the wet northwest part of New Jersey. That's where they did the... Um 
the some of the Friday the Thirteenth yeah. movies, Camp Crystal Lake. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but Crystal Lake uh, right now takes about a little over an hour to get to from Chicago. So in 1905, I'm sure it was it wasn't the easiest journey to take before the interstates were built and all that. Um, but uh, Henry ends up uh, relocating with his wife uh, and at that time one child to Crystal Lake, and he's going to make his living teaching music. So now that in my mind, I, not just music, singing and mandolin playing. So in my mind, Henry has now become this sort of con artist drifting through life. So I'm picturing, you know. Uh, uh, Professor Henry Hill from uh, The Music Man. He's going to teach everybody how to play the mandolin using the Think system. Um, but, of course, um, because it's Henry, um, things don't work out. And within the month, he's in the papers again. And this time it's because there's a mysterious fire that breaks out at the house he's renting in Crystal Lake. Uh, this, uh, again, the article describes it as uh, mysterious. It's the biggest fire that's happened in Crystal Lake in years. Um, conveniently, Henry is out of town when the fire breaks out, and his wife is not home either. Uh, the uh, neighbors reported hearing a sound like an explosion. Um, the fire department says it looks like the fire broke out in the uh, uh, dining room where the only thing that could have exploded would be a lamp, which seems a little far-fetched to me, but um, the reports indicate that uh, the residents lost uh, furniture, carpets, curtains, a piano, and many valuable paintings. So although the building itself only suffered about $300 in damage, Henry is claiming over $900 in lost uh, items, including his apparently valuable uh, art collection. <laughs> um, the interesting thing now is if you look at the end of the article, uh, Henry Bay says, oh, don't worry, I have insurance through the National of Hartford, Hartford um, and I'll make my claim. Uh, and it mentions who his insurance agent is, Mrs. H.H. H. Bay. H.H. Um, H. Bay is Hiram Bay, uh, Henry's brother. So uh, just before the mysterious fire, mind you, he's only lived there for a month, so it had to be just before, he gets... Uh, insurance that will cover these, the loss of his art collection when the fire comes and he makes that claim. So I don't know about you guys, but again, uh, this seems to reinforce to me that Henry's up to something. Uh, he's got get, get rich screams. He's got scams. He's got, uh, it's always in a scandal after this. Um, but I will let you draw your own conclusions about uh, uh, the illustrious career of Henry M. Bay. Um, so I'd like to say um, that Henry's life settled down, settles down at this point. Um, it's shortly after this that he starts listing his, uh, he relocates back to Chicago. Um, he appears to move into his father's house. Uh, his father died about this time, so he's living with his mother. And he starts listing his occupation as lawyer in the census. Um, again, you remember he was never actually admitted to practice law. So if he is a lawyer and he's practicing law, he's doing that without a license. Um, this goes on for a period of time uh, with, uh, without any mentions in the newspaper that I've been able to find, um, which is unusual because lawyers' names are appearing in the newspapers all the time every t uh, during this period. Every time they uh, incorporate a business, every time they go to court, um, you see in the social columns when lawyers visit their family, there's a one-line mention of their visits to the family. Uh, but Henry manages to stay out of the papers, or at least as far as I've been able to find so far during this time. So then we see that uh, he eventually changes the way he reports his occupation in the census to private investigator. So if we're all, let's all be curious about uh, Henry's career as a private investigator. This brings us to the next time he's mentioned in the newspaper. He's involved in a scandal as a private investigator. So, as near as I'm able to tell from reading the various articles, uh, based, uh, Henry has uh, been employed as a private investigator by a gentleman named Thomas Gonzalez. And Thomas is apparently concerned about his wife, who's pictured here. 
um, and the apparent friendships she's developed with the wealthy Lewis Olin, who's the owner of Goldenrod Ice Cream Company. Um, Goldenrod was a local ice cream company that continued to be very popular uh, and in 19, until 1976 when it was purchased by Bresslers. So some of you may have eaten Goldenrod ice cream at some point in your life or, or their successors at Bresslers. Um, so Henry uh, always wanted to take advantage of opportunity. He says, hey, there's this wealthy guy. Um, he probably wants to avoid negative press because it'll be bad for his business. And he and Mr. Gonzalez uh, threaten uh, an alienation of affection suit against Mr. Owen for him breaking up the happy, uh, the happy family. Um, and again, this doesn't actually say this in the newspapers, but from what I've come to, to imagine in my head about uh, Henry Bay, this is probably a, uh, uh, a get, another get rich scheme that he's concocted to try and take advantage of the situation. Um, so the problem is his chosen victim, Mr. Olin, is not having it. He says, go ahead and sue me. And by the way, I'm now going to the state's attorney. Uh, because what you're doing is extortion and it's against the law. You're trying to blackmail me. Uh, both uh, Mr. Gonzalez and Henry end up getting indicted for extortion. So uh, that's, that's sort of as far as I've gotten researching uh, Henry Bay. Um, again, it's uh, mostly not to do with file Fidelsa, except right there at the beginning. Um, but uh, so Henry was this law student, like so many other law students, that he was uh, affected by the adoption of Rule 39. Uh, his career plans were a little curtailed. Um, he tried to be part of the Law Student League, and uh, which was successful in getting the legislative exception passed, um, but then uh, lost the Supreme Court case for admission under that legislative exception. Um, Henry... Uh, Basically, never. Well, first of all, not only was his legal career curtailed, but his big chance of a legal impact. Uh, his name was it was uh, incorrect in the published opinion. So, all of us who know that In Ray Day case, either from constitutional history in Illinois or from our file Fidelza history, don't know his name. We know the name of this non-existent person, Henry Day, as a result of that typo. Um, he never quite recovers from his early career. He goes back and forth between jobs and scandals and schemes and um, and uh, just has this interesting life full of uh, full of uh, negative reports and newspapers and scandals. So um, I just thought, since I discovered this inter these interesting things about uh, this person that uh, indirectly we all know through File Fidelsa, um, it would be interesting to share some of what I, I what I found out about Henry to you. Um, because as I, as, I, as I like to say, especially this weekend, um, you know, we tend to know a little bit about our own file Fidelsa story, but that story is made up of literally thousands and thousands of smaller stories of our members, um, some with incredible legal careers or political careers, uh, some with less auspicious careers like Henry, um, but uh, these are all stories that sort of go together to form the network of the larger file Fidelsa story. Um, and whenever you dig into file Fidelsa's history, you find these, these characters um, that are, are sometimes impressive, sometimes less impressive, but there are all kinds of interesting stories. So um, my goal this weekend is to share some of these stories and, and hopefully um, you guys will learn a little bit more about file Fidelsa while being entertained by, by some of these stories I've, I've uh, turned up in my research. So don't rely on me for the time because these have changed a little bit. Um, but uh, later this afternoon, I'm going to be back uh, with another profile. Um, this will be about Paul Meyer, who's one of our past uh, Chief Justices of File Fidelsa uh, and Supreme Historian, um, one of the first File Fidelsa history people, which kind of uh, intrigued me about him. Um, but he has some interesting stories, not only on the PADS, uh, Lambda Epsilon and File Fidelsa side, but in his personal life, uh, beginning with his disappearance right, for, right after... Uh, the first file Fidelsa convention in 1903. Um, so I'll share a little bit about that later and I hopefully will uh, see you guys at that time. <laughs>